one of the things that people say about my book is that, that it's very emotional <laughs> and it, it does feel like you're there and I think a lot of that is taken from that first draft um, because it was just I was literally kind of just vomiting up all this love and <laughs> pain and sadness that I'd had to leave this place that first draft was just like pure emotional connection and emotional processing. Laura, I have literally been looking forward to this for several months since reading your absolutely gorgeous memoir, The Puma Years. I would really love to dive into the content and the message, but before we do that, I'd like to just pan out because as I was revisiting the memoir in preparation for today's conversation, having read the whole thing, going back to the opening few lines, I found really interesting. So I hope you don't mind me reading them to you, but just so those people watching can be aware of what we're talking about with the opening lines. Mm -hmm. It's 2007 and I'm 24 years old. I'm not small, although not really large either. About five foot seven with a crooked nose, boobs that give me backache and feet that flap. I'm a bit lost for no reason I understand. So the reason I wanted to come back to that opening, Laura, which, which really hooked me right from the get go, mm. My hunch, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you didn't start the story there when you broke the first draft or you didn't just write the whole thing in one piece. Mm -hmm. So I'm just really curious, firstly, if we touch on, if you can remember the moment when you really thought, I'm going to write this story. Yeah. Um, it happened in stages. Um, uh, well, it actually, so, uh, I, uh, as I write there, I, I first went to, to Bolivia and, and to the sanctuary, to the park in 2007, and I was there um, for two years, and the first time that I went back to the UK was in 2009, um, and yeah, it was a trip that was meant to be three months, and it ended up being over two years, and I... It was then really the when I got back um, uh, and I was staying in in my mum's house um, when I returned and I just I couldn't that I didn't have any kind of I didn't know how to process what had happened to me um, and I would kind of go to the pub with my friends and be like I fall in love with this puma <laughs> I want to live in the jungle forever and. Uh, that it was kind of just met with blank faces and uh, mm -hmm. I'm really lucky my my family and my support group is incredible and they they were incredibly supportive but I yeah I really couldn't process kind of all these emotions and all these things that had happened to me so the way that I did that was to write and to paint and make art about it so I spent I spent about I don't know how long months um, anyway just sitting in my room and writing um, uh, and drawing pictures of, of Wyra the the puma that I um, you read about in the book and um, I wrote the first draft um, then mm -hmm. and but I didn't have the I didn't have the confidence to be able to say okay this is something that I think other people are gonna want to read um, and I put it away in a drawer and went back to Bolivia um, and spent the next um, five, six years um, kind of going back and forth living in Bolivia and the UK um, and really still kind of trying to, to find a way to, to process um, these, um, these relationships and this community that I've found. And then it was um, in 2016, 2017, I was doing a, I was living in the UK and I was doing a PhD in um, art and climate change. Um, mm. And I got about halfway through and I just thought, this isn't what I want to be writing. Um, uh, I want to be writing 
the story of Waira um, and the jungle. So I left my PhD um, and I moved to an island in Scotland and I took the draft that I had started out of a drawer and I started to, to, to rewrite it. And it was that point that I really thought, um, yeah, I, I want to do this. And I think it's a story that um, I can write confidently and I think other people will want to read it. And it was, it was this, there's a lot of things that I used from that first draft, um, but it was also a very different story to the one that I'd started writing. Um, mm. I was kind of 10 years older and had more experience and sort of understanding of the world. I was in my mid-30s rather than my mid-20s. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And it's really interesting to hear that that, original draft was your attempt to process and like as you said you wouldn't have had the confidence to think oh this this could be a book mm. it really makes me think with memoir we can often have that first draft not be for ourselves we're sort of already writing for publication when mm. when i think there's something about memoir that you almost need to write that draft to process and mm. i mean you, you for you there was a 10-year gap Mm. what was the most significant difference that you noticed between the versions of the stories the difference between this is a version to process and this is a version where I'm imagining in an, an audience yeah I think I mean one of the things that people say about my book is it that, that it's very emotional <laughs> and it, it does feel like you're there and I think a lot of that is taken from that first draft um, because it was just, I was literally kind of just vomiting up all this love and <laughs> pain and sadness that I'd had to leave this place. Um, and all of that I just put on the page. So I think that first draft was just like pure emotional connection and emotional processing. And then in the second draft, I was able to kind of put that into a context um uh, a more global context mm -hmm. um uh, and yeah at the context of kind of the environmental crisis the deforestation all the changes that i witnessed um uh, on though in that kind of sanctuary on the front lines of environmental destruction um and i think that gave the story a um uh, yeah more more gravity I guess more weight um but it was also that the first draft was my relationship with Wyra for two years and then the second draft I was writing it had been we've been in a relationship for over 10 years um mm. so that definitely it, it, that was very different I think yes that's interesting actually because having read the book there's there's the, rep the there's the coming back to the mm. center, which really magnifies the emotional heart of the story. Mm. Really interesting to hear that that second version almost panned out. It wasn't just you and your emotional experience. You were starting to give it context. Mm. And I do think that is the difference between a memoir that is really just for yourself and a mm. memoir where you're like, okay, I know this story means a lot to me, but mm. what's it going to mean to other people, and, and yeah. where does it where does it sit in the landscape? Yeah, and I think at that point as well, I'd in 2012 I started a, a charity in an art space um, uh, in the south of England, and that was all to do with um, working with artists, writers, people from all different disciplines um, who were working with themes of environmental and social justice and so I think having that community and having being so privileged to be around um, kind of those sort of networks and those people who were, were working with those kinds of ideas it really helped me to expand my own kind of mm. thoughts of what I wanted to to share in 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 that story in my story yeah, that makes sense. It's almost like the kind of the research component that mm. goes alongside your own personal experience. Mm. 
I'm curious also when you look at the, the, set, the second draft, because as you say, you've got your return to the center. I'm just thinking because you, you came back tw you, in the book, you come back twice. So what was it, how, you know, what were some of the challenges or the milestones when you were rewriting or recreating that second draft, knowing, okay, I'm, I'm taking it seriously this time. So I guess the pressure was upped a little bit. Yeah, um, it, was, it was really hard. I mean, we're saying second draft, but actually um, it took me about 50 drafts. Mm. Um, and uh, I was really lucky because I um, managed to get an agent quite early on in the process and she it took us um, kind of a year, two years um, to really work through that, that draft together um, and I really str I really struggled because it it, it was very difficult to put to condense kind of because in the book I do go back twice whereas in reality I had gone back numerous times um, uh, and it was kind of struggling with um, my memory first of all mm. and sort of treading that fine line between what's truth and what's and what's not mm. um, uh, and how to make that into a kind of palatable story a readable story um, and also sort of processing there was there's a lot of self refre reflection when you write memoirs obviously um and kind of spending so much time trying to process who i was in my early 20s um and how to make that person into a into a character in a book who is me and isn't me it's again it's a it's a fine line isn't it mm -hmm. um yeah, it it was it was tough. It was <laughs> it was one of the hardest things I've I've ever had to do. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing some of those challenges because I think and thank you for correcting me because it's so easy for someone to be like, oh my god, what she wrote two drafts of this, but it's like no no, mm. it was it was over fifty and there was yeah. a lot of back and forth. So can you walk us through it? Because I know there will be people watching this who are like, oh, wow, she was so lucky. She got that agent really early mm. on and she was then able to have that collaborative process. Um, so can you just walk us through how that took place, if, if that's OK? Yeah, of course. Um, so when I decided that I wanted to do it, I went back to that draft that I had in the drawer and I wrote a kind of, I adapted it and I wrote the first um, 30,000 words or something like that um, and I sent it to a number of different agents um, and a few came back um, and I think I was really lucky because um, yeah it I think it kind of hit um, it it was the right time um, uh, people were interested in those kinds of stories and I went with the the first agent who came back to me um, uh, Samar um, she's incredible um, and she is a very hands-on editor and we yeah so I had the beginning and then I wrote it we talked about it and I, I wrote the, the first draft and then it took um, a lot of back and forth and a lot of kind of red pen and mm -hmm. kind of uh, it, it felt like I the whole process from uh, um, deciding I was going to write it until um, it um, uh, sort of being finished and uh, ready for publication was four years so it really felt like mm -hmm. I had done a PhD in mm -hmm. uh, in writing in in creative nonfiction because I mean I'd never studied writing before I, I studied English literature at university but I'd n never really written like this before um, and so it really did feel like an intensive um, PhD and it was mm. it was incredible and I felt so lucky to have someone who was willing to invest in in that story and work through it with me um, and there were obviously moments of frustration where I thought, 
like, yeah, this is amazing. And I'd send it to her and then it would come back just <laughs> absolutely decimated. <laughs> um, but each time um, I really felt that it was becoming better and it was becoming deeper. And I know people use the kind of analogy of, of um, kind of a sculptor sort of carving out a, a sculpture out of rock and you can kind of gradually see it sort of chipping away and becoming sort of more defined as, as you keep going with each draft. And that really is how it felt. Um, yeah, so it, it would have been a very different book um, uh, without her, mm -hmm. I think, um, definitely. Um, but I think, and it was definitely a, a collaborative process, mm -hmm. which yeah again I, I feel so lucky to have to have had that opportunity so this is amazing thank you so much for all of this detail because this is often the part that we don't see and often we've got you know there are people out there trying to write their memoir with no idea I love that you liken it to doing a PhD and you sort of give that time scale of four years because it really helps someone relate to what it takes and what mm. needs to be learned in the process mm. so it's interesting because earlier on you were talking about the fact that you did more than two visits back to Bolivia to the to the Amazon rainforest but you had to condense them. Mm. Um, you talked about the fact that you had to turn yourself into a character. And it's interesting because as I was listening to you, I was like, oh, these are real points of craft. Mm. But now I'm getting the understanding of, oh, perhaps the Laura at the beginning of that four year journey hadn't learnt those points of craft yet. No, no not at all. Yeah. <laughs> So those are two great ones, you know, writing the memoir, it's not a case of this happened, then that happened, then this happened, then that happened. It's a case of, you know, where's that narrative arc and how mm. can I condense certain events and trips to really fulfill that narrative arc, which you do. Mm. And also how can I al almost like witness myself and allow myself to talk about myself as a character? Yeah. What, what other points do you think were really crucial to you being able to tell the story as, as beautifully as you have? I think really figuring out what I wanted to say. Um, uh, and that took a long time as well. Um, because there are so many strands. There's obviously in every story, there are lots of strands. And uh, it, I suppose that kind of relates to kind of putting myself into a making myself into a character and I found what what I did was I sort of caricatured myself so in each of the different drafts I would sort of pull out a part of my personality and make that the focus um and so I became that character became quite two-dimensional mm -hmm. so and then with each draft that I wrote I think <clears throat> potentially I was able to kind of layer all those the things together um, and I think it was the same with the themes so uh, what did I want to focus on and ultimately what I wanted to fo I wanted it to be a love story um, mm -hmm. and that was something I sort of had to fight for really um, uh, that I wanted it to be a love story between a, a woman and a puma and I didn't want it to be a love story between a girl and a boy or mm. anything like that. Um, so I was really, so I suppose, and I think I knew that from the beginning, but maybe it um, it got lost or within or, or amongst all the other things. So I think really sort of keeping hold of those kind of core directions that you that you want to to share in your story and uh, yeah being true to being true to those things mm. um yes that it's it's so great to hear your intention on the other side and to now reflect on that because i think that's why i found it so impactful because it was a love story between a woman and an animal mm. um to me, I just found that incredibly moving. Mm. The other thing I want to touch on, Laura, is you mentioned earlier that you would send that draft to your agent being like, yes, you know, that this, this is it. 
and then it would come back with the red pen and I think that's such a lovely share because it really reminds me about that part in the writing process where you can only get as far as your current ability and so it feels your absolute very best and therefore mm. it feels the best yeah but when you're open to that collaboration and you trust somebody you then allow them to sort of suggest the next level that you could take yourself yeah so can you tell us a little bit about how you navigated that like for those people who have just had that feedback and they're like oh I thought I was there and <laughs> you know I, I feel a bit inflamed by the fact that it isn't fantastic that they're critiquing yeah. it how do you trust someone enough to say okay I'm, I'm going to go where you're where you're encouraging me to yeah. go that's a really nice way of putting it and it's it's so true um and to have to have someone that you trust enough to be able to do that is so incredible um and i think yeah i mean the moment it's it's so wonderful when you think you're there <laughs> such elation and then it's that utter heartbreak <laughs> mm. when you're told that you're not there mm. <laughs> um and it's you it, it's a kind of constant having to reframe I guess your your way of looking at it and your way of looking at the work and the way of looking at yourself because you're so tied to it it's such an emotional thing and it's so raw um and I think it I'm kind of wondering how we got to that kind of level of trust and I think it really I I did I just trusted that she she knew better than me and she had the capacity to make my work better um and I sort of tried to approach it as humbly as possible I think mm. um and just to to it to be in that kind of relation relationship of kind of student teacher that's what it felt like um and to be learning and i i think i i wanted it to be the best book it could be and i think that that's that's what is so that's what you have to hold in your in your heart and mm -hmm. as long as you trust that that person is making it better and uh, i would have maybe when I got my draft back I would have maybe I don't know half a day or something where I'd look through the comments and I would let myself be utterly heartbroken and then I would go for a walk or something or just sit outside and think through what she had told me think through those comments and eat every time I would be like oh okay I understand that that's gonna make it better and uh, I can do that and I think that's the thing it's it as you say it's kind of pushing yourself that person is pushing yourself to your next level and the next level and the next level um, and you're making it better and that is that's such a incredible it's such a privilege to be able to 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 be in that kind of collaborative um, mm. uh, collaborative working relationship yeah, and listening to you really outline those points of what makes a collaborative relationship, I think it's such a powerful distinction for you to make that you wanted the book to be the best it could be. Because I think we can get into a, a strange dynamic with our writing where it feels personal, where the book feels like we want to be accepted. But if there's this case of like, no, I'm going to do whatever I can for this, mm. this project to be the best it can be. Mm. And also what you said about you so wanted it to be the version you know when when you sent it to her there was this kind of like you know I, re I really want this to be it and like oh god it's not because I think mm. we can get stuck in that place because yeah. we just can't bear we can't bear that we have to do any more so we yeah. have to have some motivation to to mm. help us move through that and if if yeah. that sort of constant value of I want this to be the best yeah and then also that lovely process you were going to say something. I was just going to say, I didn't want to, to interrupt you, but I was just going to say that it's, it's so hard to be a writer and to that, the sense of panic that time is kind of, 
this is taking such a long time and uh, four years is a really long time but it's also not when you think about how long other books have taken to to write so I guess it's that kind of putting it into perspective and balancing okay so I could put this out now but it's not going to be as good as it would be if maybe I spent another year on it or two years and uh, yeah sort of balancing that that real sense of panic that Mm. I have to do this I have to the sense of urgency I suppose versus the the real kind of pleasure of of the craft and the process yeah I'm really glad that you said that actually because I know that's something I've experienced myself and I think that 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 urgent state is such a it 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 really prevents a project from being its absolute best because we're not taking action from a creative rational place we're taking action from a totally stressed out state yeah um and and not a creative perspective and it's so funny laura because when we're at the center we're sort of freaking out about the time it takes Mm. but i absolutely bet that everybody watching this or listening to this is thinking i feel so good that it took her to write four years took her four years to write this like it gives me permission i understand why it took four years it's only when we're at the center of it that we're like yeah it's taken four years too long yeah (laughs) And that process that you described as well, it's lovely. You got the notes and you allowed yourself to have that moment mm. of, of freak out. Like, I, you know, yeah. for me, I call it allowing, allowing the meltdown, but you're sort of yeah. slightly, you know, slightly consciously allowing it. But what yeah. you then took is, is, is beautifully healthy action. You were saying you, you would go out, you know, it's no surprise you would go for a walk or you would sit Mm -hmm. outside. Like I think getting into the arms of nature Mm -hmm. when you're at that point in a creative project, for me, it's, it's number one. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. So on a, on another point, I mean, we sort of talked about what was motivating you, this desire for the book to be the very best, but also how did you stay motivated in terms of showing up to do the work, in terms of giving it your best? So throughout that writing process, particularly through those difficult times that you've talked about. Mm. I think it just complete stubbornness <laughs> and just absolutely knowing that this was the story I wanted to write and just that I had to I had to put it down on on paper and and get it out and to do it was really kind of in sort of gratitude to to Wyra and Comunidad Intuariasi which is the 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 sanctuary um and the NGO in Bolivia and all the people that I'd met and who had peoples and animals um, who had given me a home and allowed me to to live side by side with their stories and to share their stories with them um, uh, I wanted to I wanted to do it for them and I wanted to write a story that that did them justice that that was that they would feel was was the right story or or that would kind of yeah, that would allow other people to to be able to read about and hear about the work that they were doing. Um, and I think, yeah, that was, I just had pure determination that I was gonna <laughs> I was gonna do that. <laughs> but there were wobbles, of course. Mm. There are huge moments where I thought, oh my god, this is what am I doing? This is never going to be published. I'm wasting my time, blah, 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 all that. I'm never going to be, I'm not going to be able to make it good enough. Um, Mm. And that was so hard, but so, so many creatives feel like that. Um, And yeah, it's, it's it's a process. It's all up and down, isn't it? It is. and, And you're so right in terms of many creators will feel that it's never going to happen i'm never going to get it to be good enough and and really what you said before is almost like a coaching 101 because if like if i'm working with someone who's at that point of struggle Mm. we do start to pan out to find that motivation like you said Mm. the stubbornness that that absolute refusal to walk away Mm. because sometimes we can almost have a reflexive pattern that when when the going gets tough we do jump ship and we start Mm. on a new project so it sounds that you have that staying power 
but also the book is is more than just you there's mm. the animals there's the people there's the center mm. so i think again it's so it's so clear that when a writer just has that motivation of i i want to get published it's mm. it's never enough mm. there has to be that wider motivation yeah. otherwise that that doubt of it's never going to happen is mm. going to be too heavy a weight to counter the i want to get published yeah and i think also the the joy of the story right the the love for it and the those moments often it was a uphill battle but often when you're in the flow and you're writing it's there's no feeling like it and uh, that's it, it's was such a <clears throat> such an amazing thing to be able to just just keep on doing that and and living in my head in the jungle um with wire um yeah yeah let's let's dive into the to the jungle but i i'd like to come to the story first by looking at, at the voice laura because um that was the thing that really impacted me when i was when i was reading the book um i just it's it's incredibly descriptive but i i want to say something a bit more about that because I think sometimes people can think, oh, in order to be a good writer, I've got to be descriptive. Mm. But to me, that's a little bit like saying, in order to be authentic, I've got to be really crazy and out there. It's like, no, that's just one person's version of authenticity. You've got to mm. find what authentic looks for you. So descriptiveness might be a natural component of your voice or mm. it might not be. Yeah. When I was reading the book i just had a sense of a woman who had learnt how to be so still in time as almost to see the moment freeze frame it was like mm. the frames of your life had been so enlarged and so slowed down that you could really take your time to point out everything that was there and it didn't seem to me to be someone who was writing description from a love of words but more from a love of what they were seeing oh that's beautiful that's lovely thank you <laughs> so i suppose yes how aware you know does that reading feel true to you and, and how aware were you of the of the way or the voice that you were using um i i think was i aware of it one of the kind of key sort of things that I knew that I wanted is that I wanted the the landscape to be to feel like a character in mm -hmm. itself. Um, so I wanted the jungle to be as real as a, a person, a human, or and I wanted the animals to be as real as to have characters that were as real as as the pe as the humans. Um, so I think that was part of it. But I also, I mean, you're right. I had spent years standing in those landscapes and just taking it in and, and absorbing it um, mm. in a time when we didn't have phones or um, internet. So there was nothing that you could do but stand there um, with your animal, with the animal that you were caring for and just absorb it and I think that is that is what is on the page I think um mm. and I think I I've I've always I have always been quite a descriptive writer um and to to my detriment I think I I used too much description there is a lot that was cut out <laughs> wow wow <laughs> yeah my my mum is an incredible editor as well and she's very harsh <laughs> <laughs> so she cut out a lot of my description mm. um and uh, but i think the the rawness of the experience of being in the jungle and um, being with animals when you have to be 100 percent present there's no other you have no other choice mm -hmm. um uh, and i think 
yeah, I, I think that is, that was the sense that I wanted to convey in the book. And I, and I you, hope I've done that. Yes, you do, because what it gives the reader, certainly what it gave me, was the closest to being able to experience that myself, like to be in the jungle when the day is allowed to inf unfold at its real time, mm. because like you say, there aren't devices, you're not distracted. Mm. What's so lovely is when you, you know, there's lots of moments for self-reflection, but we do get these gorgeous passages where you are just witnessing the the landscape mm. and you know you you mentioned the characters um i i'd love to just chat a little bit about wire but also to talk about some of the other characters as well i mean the book mm. is, is it's got such an incredible ensemble cast two-legged <laughs> four-legged feathered furred it you know it really they are all so real but obviously the central theme in your in in the book is your evolving relationship with with the rescue puma waira mm. and um the bond for me it really highlights those themes of trust you know i mm. it sort of we talked about trust with your agent but you, you know what an incredible learning that mm. you had with waira um healing obviously that came about and the mutual respect, because I'm even now, I'm thinking of one occasion when Wyra, you know, turns on you, she, she attacks you, but your reflection in the book was very much to understand that you had crossed a boundary, you had done something wrong. Mm. So that absolute mutual respect, and as you just shared, you had to be absolutely present. Mm. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit I mean, it, it, I know it's hard because you had to write an entire book to share your love affair with Wyra. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just for someone who hasn't yet read the book and is sort of thinking, OK, I know there's, a, I know there's this puma that she's in love with, like, mm. but what was going on between the two of them? What was this relationship? Can you just talk a little bit about it? Yeah, so uh, Wyra was a um, puma. She was rescued from the black market. Um, uh, all of the animals in the sanctuary um, are... Um, they're through, they've either come through the illegal pet trade, they've been at circuses or zoos, or they've been rescued um, from fires, deforestation, habitat loss. The majority of them can't be released, um, uh, particularly with the big cats. Um, so for Waira, she was, that was the case with her. So when I met her, she was three years old. Um, she um, was... Um, uh, the sanctuary um, is a Bolivian-run sanctuary um, and the kind of real sort of guiding force behind it is to give these animals who have had their lives and their homes taken from them, give them a, a second chance um, at uh, as natural and as wild a life as, as we can give them if they cannot be released. Um, so uh, the uh, there are kind of different stages of of rehabilitation and and work with these animals. Some of them um, are too traumatized um, and too damaged to be able to um, have contact um, with humans. Um, so they have large enclosures um, and are given kind of enrichment and um, companionship if they want it. Um, and um, we do as much as we can. Um, the, um, some of them are able to be um, taken out of their cages um, and walked through. Um, they have each have their own trails in the jungle. Um, so the, there is quite a high level of, of contact with the animals. Um, and that has um, kind of changed over the years. Um, when I went there in 2007, the, the way we worked with the animals was very different to how we work with them now. Um, and that's obviously lesson lessons that have been learned over the years. Um, uh, and really, the organization hasn't, doesn't have any government support, no government funding. And it's really just people who are so desperate to help these animals um, mostly without kind of training or 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 um kind of degrees in animal behavior they they just want to help um and they have the kind of 
the, at the core is is real is real love and respect mm -hmm. um, for these creatures, and so I was kind of uh, taught by these people in the sanctuary um, who um, had have dedicated their lives to um, these animals. Um, and Wyra, yeah, I met her when she was three, and she was incredibly traumatized and nervous. Um, she was one of the more um, difficult animals. Um, it's safe to say, that, yeah, that's true. Um, and I think it was, yeah, I mean, how how the sanctuary works is that you. Um, get assigned a particular animal and then you um it's a bit different now because we have less volunteers and there are more animals um but back then you got given one animal and you would work with that animal from uh, kind of early in the morning until until sunset so you'd be with them um seven days a week um uh, all daylight hours and it would often just be you and them in the jungle um and it was that's they she taught me so much about um uh, as you say about trust and and love and what it means to be in a relationship with um an animal who, a creature who's so different from from you mm -hmm. um but to have kind of shared shared experiences um uh, she was learning how to be in the jungle she was terrified of the jungle because she'd been taken out of it um as uh um when she was very very young her hunters had most likely killed her mother and then she was sold on the black market as a pet so she had very little experience um and training about how to interact with the jungle what a monkey was what uh, what it sounded like when you trod on a stick like all those things would um kind of she would get terrified and anyone who knows who's worked with rescue animals um it r really feels like um each kind of it's so i use the an analogy in the book of an onion and it's it, it is like layers being unpeeled and each time you you kind of expose a new layer of um personality and trauma um, uh, and it was really kind of me and her um, and the other volunteers that I was working with along the way um, learning how to how to live together and how to how to how to make wire as happy as we could um, or how to give her the best experience we could in in a world where her um, her the life that she was meant to have was taken away from her. Sorry, mm. that was a rambling answer. <laughs> it was, it's beautiful, Laura. And I'm, I'm just sitting here tr trying to hold it together, basically, because as I, sh as I shared before we started recording, I haven't been able to talk about this book and that relationship without just crying because it, it touches me so profoundly. Mm. And as I'm listening to you reflecting back, I'm really reminded of what it is about your experience that feels so huge. It's more than just the experience of one woman and one puma. Mm. Firstly, this, this divine opportunity to spend sunrise to sunset seven days a week in presence mm. with another being and to have to be very alive to being in presence because that being is a dangerous animal and is a traumatized animal. So it's, for me, I think it, it it's almost like a part of me l would love to be able to have that training of being in presence with another being and to experience the depths mm. that you can therefore mm. attain as a result of that. Yeah, yeah. And also the absolute heart at the center of this organization that says, here is one puma who didn't get to have the life that they were meant to have. And we will do whatever we can, whatever resources we have for this one animal. Yeah. Like to me, I'm just like, oh, people, organizations like that exist. It's, mm. it's so wonderful to counteract, yeah. as you say, the the deforestation, the trafficking, the, the things that go on on the other side. I mean, there are times, there are definite times when you're kind of, um, 
where you where I wonder kind of should we be doing more should, sh are there different things that we can be doing um, when actually it so to say that those creatures matter you matter enough to dedicate all our time to to making you happy that is that narrative and that story is so important um, yes there are other things so many things going along alongside that there's the deforestation and forest fires and all those things that are constantly being fought on the sidelines but at the same time constantly reminding yourselves that those beings matter um, uh, and it's yeah it's such a such a privilege to to have have been able to have that experience um, with those animals and also it helps me really understand the the center of the healing like how beautiful to be part of a dynamic that at its very core value has this kind of you matter it's mm -hmm. like nothing's too small or too too large yeah. to put focus and attention yeah versus that kind of like oh you know let, let's just write it off it's just you know we, we we don't have the manpower or we don't have the resources yeah, yeah. laura i'm aware that our time is coming to a close it's it's whizzed by and oh, as much I as i yes as much yeah. as i'd love to tuck you in my pocket and keep talking to you <laughs> <laughs> um there's i mean we we've we've scratched the surface we've mm. we've only really just touched on on the content but i certainly recommend anybody who has been moved by this conversation to order the book straight away we'll put links below but I'd love to just give you just a few minutes, perhaps just to reflect on the conversation, because it could be that we didn't go in a direction that you'd hoped. You were like, oh, we didn't get to talk about this or we didn't get to talk about that. So is there just something that you sense that wants to be spoken or something that you just want to share as a result of our conversation today? Um, I think it's, well, firstly, thank you for, for having me here and, and letting me talk about about wire and the and the sanctuary and my experiences I could talk about it all day <laughs> I've written a whole book about it <laughs> um I think this conversation is a really nice time because it um my uh three years on from publication in English it's about to be published in Spanish um and uh, so it's coming out in a few weeks in Bolivia um, and that really feels like um, it was sort of w what I wanted right from the that was kind of I couldn't imagine the my if my friends in Bolivia were able to read it um, that was so special but I guess I also just wanted to say that this this was this is my story but there were so many other people who it I wasn't unique in having that relationship with Wyra. So many other people who had visited, gone to the sanctuary, whether they stayed for two weeks or 12 years, um, everyone who went there had a s similar experience, bonding experience with um, with one of the animals. And every one of them could, could write hundreds of books about it. Um, uh, and that is... Uh, just I think I just want to say thank you to to the sanctuary and those people who are out there um fighting every day on the on the front lines to keep to keep those animals safe um and that's yeah it's it's an incredible thing that they do and every time I sort of um feel hopeless about the situation in the world or the outlook I just think about them who who are able to keep fighting in the most awful conditions and still have hope um, in their hearts because they, and I think seeing those animals and living with those animals every day is, it really does, it really does give you, give you hope. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm glad that you touched on some of the other volunteers and the relationships that they were also having with their charges mm. because you actually do a really lovely job of just 
touching on a few of the other relationships and you do kind of get you know just with a few deft strokes we really get a sense of my god Mm. everyone is having a similar not similar in terms of they were all having the exact emotional transformation there's a sense actually that each experience was very unique and Mm. the the sort of flavor of the love was very unique as well yeah because each of the animals are different each of the people are different but each of the animals are different as well and um that was something that i learned um as well working in the sanctuary that everyone has a different personality different histories different experiences and um you need to react to that in different ways um as you say no 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 one is the same so yeah each of those stories are unique beautiful laura And finally, people watching this, if they wanted to reach out, I know that you're on Instagram. Are you, are you reach outable too? Yeah. 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 So what's the best way for someone to be like, oh my gosh, Laura, I loved it. I loved the book. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, you can find me on Instagram or you can uh, email me um, uh, at, um, yeah. Put those links. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put it on yeah. website email and instagram below. Yeah. yeah yeah just send me an email and i always love hearing from people as as i did as <laughs> i did so yeah yeah thank you so much for your time today laura it's been such a treat thanks for having me yeah.